Um, I think what's special about Opportunity and Spirit is what they can mean to so many people. Um, and they are robots, for sure, but they are much more than that. And I think that for us making the film and getting to meet the people who worked on them, that was what really stuck out to us. If they were just robots and viewed as such, it wouldn't be the film that it is, it wouldn't be the story that it is, and you wouldn't, wouldn't be the work that you do. But because they mean so much to so many people, they're much more than that. And I think that's what's so special. Yeah, I think all the generations of people who got to work, generations. <laughs> well, that's awesome that you said true. that. Like, I, hey, that old guy next to me. <laughs> <laughs> you were in a different generation <laughs> than I was when it came to working on Spirit and Opportunity. What I what I loved so much is watching the film, and even though I came in uh, later in Opportunity's life, we all talk about them the same way. They all mean so much to us, which continues to carry out through the entirety of their lives. Um, and I thought that was so cool because until I sat down and watched the movie, I didn't realize that we all really talk about the Rovers like they're our kids. kids. Yeah. And I sure felt that, but to see how everybody felt that was just really meaningful and touching. I think that was the big draw to the story for Jess and me. We've always made character-based documentaries. Usually we're following a person or a group of people going through something intense or crazy in their lives is the, the basis for most of our films. And even though these were robots, they were character-driven robots. And that's because the scientists and engineers behind them really did anthropomorphize them or connect with them in that type of way. So to us, it was like your classic underdog story of someone with a certain amount of expectations who exceeds those and goes through all those challenges. So not unlike any sort of animated or Pixar film where you have your protagonist who's expected to do one thing and then has to surmount all those challenges. I think that's really how we, we took this film on and we never expected it to be so emotional. You know, we had, uh, a cast of scientists and engineers, sorry to call you guys a cast, but that's the word we use. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we were constantly surprised with how emotional, because I think we have these preconceived notions as scientists and engineers as really practical, rational, unemotional people, and we were constantly surprised with the human cast, with how attached they actually were to these robots. So in that way, it was sort of the perfect fusion between a character and the robot, but also her humans back on Earth that loved her. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to be part of the team that you know, birthed these vehicles, right? So uh, I was part of the team that designed them and built them and then sent them on their way. And so from that perspective, you have this love and hate relationship with them. You know, uh, before we got our name, Spirit and Opportunity, we lovingly called them Beavis and Butthead. Mm -hmm. um, and not because we didn't like one of them more than the other, just because there was problems and they did weird things from time to time. And you, you get this sort of, I want my child to do well, but I want my child to leave. And by the time we got through, you know, what we call the assembly test launch operations, which is ATLO, when we were there at the Cape getting ready to leave and you see some of that footage, most of the team is so excited that they're on their way to college, right? We're getting rid of them. And then they do this boring period of flying through inner solar space and then they graduate, you know, and their graduation is this six minutes or seven minutes of terror, however you want to look at it, and then they get on the surface and they send us back our first pictures. And you just, all of a sudden, you have this unbelievable love of that child all over again, right? You, you had sent them away and you didn't think about them for a while and they were doing stuff and it was sort of boring. And then they do this amazing thing and then you're like, oh my God, how amazing is this? And then, you know, I, I, it's hard to capture this because it's that emotion thing that you're thinking. It's like, what do you say? And my, I called my mother and I told her, you know, um, I've achieved everything in my life I've ever wanted to do, right? My child's on the surface of another planet. She's sort of like, so what are you gonna do now? I'm like, well, maybe we'll build another one. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing is you go through these ups and downs. Um, you know, you, you look at Opportunity's life and, and you know, she lands in a crater, you know, functionally 300 million miles away. So it's this 300 million mile and out, you know, 300 million mile hole in one. And we're supposed to find this mineral called hematite. And we literally turn on the cameras, take a first picture, and here's hematite, right? And so now it's like, okay, what do we do? Well, we'll drive to another crater, right? And, and you know, um, you're just amazed at the ability to keep driving and keep driving and then get stuck. 
And then you feel bad, like, why did you get stuck, you crazy little person? You're not supposed to do that. You know, you don't drive in the snow. And um, then she gets unstuck and you're like, hey, we're unstuck and we're keep going. And, and, you know, like people like Becca have to figure out how to do that. But from my perspective, it was just sort of like you have these ups and downs even through lasting so long. And, you know, there was a point, I will be honest, at which we were like, maybe we should stop now because the next one might not live this long. And what are people going to think? And then you think, nope. Just keep going, you know, and, and um, so that, that's just an amazing thing. You know, when you ask about 5,000 saws, it's just like it hits you like a brick, right? I mean, I was thinking, you know, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, you know, but this long, it's, it was <laughs> it's, it's an incredible thing. Following the footsteps of all of the engineers before me and uh, hearing the lessons learned from all of the missions and – we try and do a really good job of that at JPL, documenting our lessons learned and making sure we don't make the same mistakes again. Um, and so, so that that's in, that's awesome and great, and it's really cool to be in the position I am, late a younger engineer who gets to hear all the stories and stuff, and then implement that. Um, but there's a lot a lot more rigor and a, a lot higher expectations of us to be more perfect. Um, and sometimes when they hand you all of these uh, requirements or things to now go off and b build ourselves, we haven't gotten to learn the lessons that they did. We just get to read about them. And I think in some ways that's harder because um, we have to just trust that that's the right way to go and continue to operate it that way. But other problems always come up. <laughs> and uh, working on Perseverance, the newest rover on Mars, um, I think, you know, how each child is different, each rover is different, has a different personality. Each rover is also very different and has different problems and different, not only different mechanisms to learn about, but different problems to solve. Um, so it's always different, uh, always new problems to solve. And um, yeah, it's just been, it's an incredible, it's an incredible job. I, <laughs> I love my job. I mean, yeah, it's and, great. You know, if you go back to when we were building Spirit and Opportunity, Right. There was an enormous weight on the engineering group about how we had to be successful. Right. We had had NASA as a whole. Right. If you remember that time period, had had so many we won't call them missteps, but the public opinion had swayed away from what NASA was and what its mission was and what its goals were. And here's this little rover mission that, you know, wasn't under the radar, but wasn't above the radar. It wasn't like, oh, this is one of the big flagship missions like Galileo or Voyager. <clears throat> We're going back to a planet that we had been to. We had put a rover on the surface with Pathfinder. And this was the primary part of this mission. And, you know, you take somebody like Steve Squires, who's a dynamic individual, you know, out there saying, hey, this is going to change the way we think of planetary science and doing mobile scientific investigation with these two rovers. And then you add on that NASA had to be successful. Right, we had to get these on the surface. They had to be successful, and that was the. I, I will tell you. I, I mean, I still feel that pressure, right? Because we would sit there at night and go, "We can't fail," and that's an unbelievably hard thing to do when you're trying to land a vehicle, you know, so far away, yeah. is to not be able to think of failure as an option, yeah. right? And how do you put in? And you see this in the film. You see that energy. Uh, through when you see Rob Manning or you see Squires or you see any of the other team members that are there talking about how we tested and we retested and then we tried to break and then we rebroke and and that pressure was so built up and you just see it fall out of everybody on landing day. We get that first image and you just see everybody sort of release. And, you know, I will say this story to some people here, which is there is a room that nobody sees. There is the celebration room and then there's the room where everybody's sitting there trying to figure out what the heck went wrong. Uh -huh. And nobody sees the what went wrong room. You only see the happy room. Mm -hmm. And if something went bad, there was another room of people that would have been killing themselves so we could tell what went wrong to make sure it didn't happen for opportunity because spirit landed first. And yeah. that was super stressful. <laughs> that was a really bad room to be in. Mm -hmm. But you think about it now and you, you look back at it and you're just like, that changed how people perceived what we were doing. At that point in time at Mars, Mars had won more times than we had. You know, missions to Mars had been very unsuccessful. We were at 33% success rate going to Mars. And we've literally changed that number over the last two decades to be almost 50-50, which is amazing. 
if you look at Spirit and Opportunity, right, they were a primary mission, but they weren't a big mission. And at the time, we landed with a system that is only really capable of about delivering, a, let's say, call it 200 to 250 kilos to the surface with the airbags. And so when we wanted to do Curiosity and then Perseverance, we were trying to land a metric ton. We had to fundamentally change the paradigm in which we were trying to land, right? So then we go to the sky crane landing with these downward looking retro rocket segments. So that's part of it. The other thing is we actually changed fundamentally our power source. We were going to the surface, we were gonna use solar energy, right? And I'm, maybe you guys picked this up at some point in time. I was the person that actually, my team, helped design and build that solar array. And so for us, it was like, how long can you live in a dusty place with a solar array that's trying to create energy for a vehicle? 600 watts, you know, less than the lighting that we have in here is what that vehicle's, you know, more or less able to produce. And so you look at what did we change? Everything, right? You know, the motors that are on uh, Spirit and Opportunity are brush motors. You don't like to send brush motors to space because the brush is wear. And that wear mechanism is a total unknown phenomenon in a plasma. Okay, people that understand this are going, oh, that's really cool. And people that don't care, yeah, it's wearing as it spins around. So we're going to die at some point in time and it's going to stop working like we drug a, uh, you know, a wheel. Um, so we went to brushless motors, something that doesn't wear at, the, at that particular place. So there's lots of little changes. And then you talk about electronics and storage and the ability to communicate, right? We thought we were going to have to communicate back to Earth. Now we have five assets that are flying around uh, you know, Mars that we can actually send information to and get stuff back so that we can see things in, I won't call it real time, but more real time. Mm -hmm. You get data back. So you talk about the other parts because I'll just talk about the engineering stuff. Well, I, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just add a little to that. Um, <laughs> I, I thought it was really funny because <clears throat> in college, I wanted, this was my dream job to work on opportunity. Um, and I was like trying to do everything I could to get to the point where I could work on opportunities. So got to JPL, they're like, okay, Becca, here you go, your dream, here, here it is. And I sit down at the computers and start reading the data for the first time and I'm like, the, we're at NASA? Like this is really old <laughs> stuff that we're looking at. And I, I, was, I was honestly surprised, but after a lot of education, about like, yeah, Becca, well, well, you know, these landed in 2004, so you're, we're still using the same technology and we, it's working and we don't, you know, it's, and it's how, oppor like opportunity, the flight software on opportunity has to communicate with us in the same way. So anyway, learning how that, that all worked was actually interesting because it's still something that you have to be educated on, even though as someone who's in college and knows how to use a Mac computer and yada, 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 Just like it's still, <laughs> Sorry. it's still, it's still a, a process we had to learn. Going to Perseverance, the ground tools that we have on Perseverance are, I would say, leaps and bounds more advanced than we had as far as the ground tools were reading the data from um, Opportunity and we can process the data a lot more quickly. Um, so we get to see it more in real time, not exactly real time, but as close to real time as possible. So that's all really cool. And it's been awesome as somebody who started an opportunity to see the progression of the tools, um, at least the ground tools, progress over time. So that's awesome. Now the technology that's used inside of the vehicles hasn't changed that much. The cameras are significantly better. The cameras are significant. The flight software, though, oh, yeah. is, um, you're right. The me you're a mechanism guy. <laughs> of course, you're thinking about the mechanisms. The mechanisms hardware, are incredible. There's, there's a lot the of software, updates. there's hardware and software. The hardware is incredibly, we have color cameras. Like, it makes our life so much easier now, et cetera, et cetera. The software s hasn't changed that much. And so, anyway, it's, it's awesome. All of it's <laughs> awesome. And learning about it's awesome. And getting to learn how, how to make it better is awesome. As an engineer, is the funnest is the funnest but, part. But I think I think fundamentally, your question is: it's there are always incremental changes, yeah. Yeah. right? It's not like we threw away you know the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. You have to maintain that 15 year knowledge base that you had, and then keep building on it. That's right. And so, like when we're talking about the software, the software is still the basic software that we had, even back to Pathfinder. Yeah. But you're just layered on yeah. significantly more complexity in terms of the data that you can get back so that you can understand some of the things that Beck was talking about before, which is the lessons learned. Yeah. Hey, we had this particular failure and we didn't have the ability to um, get this information. How do we add that? How do we, we do that in a time where now we can get 
more information back for the rover so that here on Earth we can start to process that data and understand what did happen. Why did this occur in this particular way? Why did we fault or why did we get it interrupt? Why is our memory not working in the same way? Um, and so those types of things that you know come out in the movie as well, where we're talking about not having the ability to store all the data that we wanted to or upload a whole new flight software, those things are things that we learned, and then we're like, okay, here's how we fix that. You know, here's how we fix that on on a planetary, you know, another planetary surface. Mm -hmm.